When you need to focus on building, do you want to get bogged down by your database? MongoDB is an intuitive, flexible document database that lets you get to building. MongoDB's document model is a natural way to represent data, so you can focus on what matters. MongoDB Atlas is the best way to use MongoDB. It's a global cloud database service that gives you all of the developer productivity of MongoDB, plus the added simplicity of a fully managed database service. You can get started free with MongoDB Atlas at mongodb.com slash atlas. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Nadia Ekbal. She is the author of Working in Public, Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. Nice to chat with you again. It's been a number of years. Yeah, it's nice to talk to you again. Yeah, so you've got this great new book from Stripe Press that's out. And um, I really like the title. Like It's about open source software, but working in public sometimes feels like that's what we're doing now, aren't we? Yes, thank you. It, uh, it, I struggled on that title for a very, very long time, and then it finally came at the very last minute. So, and I'm I'm pretty happy with it too. Yeah, and you try to cover a lot in this book, but you open up with how people make, and you go right to uh, right to GitHub as a platform. Yes, that's right. Why start with that? Like, there's other places that people make, but you kind of started with GitHub. Is it just because it's the eighty percent place? Yeah, you mean within the world of open source, why GitHub? Right. Yeah, I mean, I actually try to actively make that argument in working in public that GitHub is sort of de facto. I mean, I, would, I actually don't really know the numbers. I would guess it might even be more than 80% at this point. Um, mm. But the place where we can observe a lot of these interesting developments in open source culture happening. Um, and so it makes sense to focus on that as a sort of like microcosm of being able to deeply understand open source developers. I think one of the things that um, historically when we talk about open source, we're always talking about this like very broad sense of there are of course other places where people develop um, open source software besides GitHub, but sometimes I feel like it does a disservice to the enormous cultural effect that GitHub itself has had and, and sort of like prevents people from wanting to study that specifically more deeply. Um, mm -hmm. And so I kind of set the stage for that in the book where Acknowledging that, yes, this stuff um, also happens elsewhere, but I'm really interested in kind of going more deeply into that platform. Yeah, you had an interesting way of phrasing it. You said that, and this is a quote, GitHub had a meteoric impact on open source. It crashed to the roof of the church of free and open source software and landed in the pews, crushing everything beneath. Yeah, I really wanted to draw this parallel between... Um, developers and other types of creators, which I do throughout the book. So mm -hmm. um, comparing open source developers to other, you know, YouTube creators or um, Instagram influencers um, and, and saying like, this is just yet another type of creator that we need to understand in that lens. And mm -hmm. I think um, having GitHub as that platform to contrast it against, um, if, you know, YouTube creators get YouTube, then open source developers get GitHub. And so I'm um, just highlighting that relationship between the platform and the creator that is uh, very unique. Yeah. And you also point out something that I think is easy to forget, especially for new people who are getting started in software, is that Git just came out in 2005. Like this is like the iPad. We didn't have them. And then one day we had them and it just took yes. over. It's so wild. I mean, I remember the first time I realized that I just sort of like, yeah, I think it's really just like underappreciated just how recent Git itself is. Um, and so, so many of the developments that we're seeing in open source now, um, especially when we compare it back to maybe like the earlier stage of things being written in the late 90s or early 2000s, like Git didn't even exist back then. And so it is just a different conversation that we're having now. Yeah. And when Stallman's and others and the folks really kind of started kicking the free and open source software uh, world into gear, this was just in the, in the 80s, which may seem like an eternity for a lot of people. But honestly, 40 years ago isn't that isn't that far, but everything kind of went hockey stick on the graph as soon as Git and GitHub came in, the meteor as you described it. Yes. Yeah. So you you also say that you have a thesis that kind of runs throughout the book, which that um, the popular conception of how open source works is kind of fundamentally flawed. The idea that we're all out there in a distributed, happy, really participatory, participatory community, and everyone's kind of like working together. It may be, maybe not true. 
Yeah, I wanted to take that sort of early conception about open source, where it's really almost exclusively framed as this um, decentralized, participatory, collaborative endeavor among uh, loosely affiliated developers all over the world who might not even know each other personally, um, mm-hmm. which absolutely does exist and is to some extent this current and this um, thread that runs throughout all of open source. But I wanted to expand that the way that we think about it to include this uh, sort of like relatively speaking, newer wave of projects where you might not have this big, shiny, happy community of um, lots of different active contributors. And you might instead have just a couple of maintainers who are sort of at the helm of a project that is being used by uh, millions of other people. And they, the relationship that they have with their users or with um, casual contributors is not really quite like how we typically think of communities in the sense of this participatory membership kind of dynamic, but might be a little bit more parasocial where um, it's, it's a one-sided kind of relationship. And so um, saying, you know, like this is also happening in open source and what can we understand from that? Mm -hmm. I think that, that word, honestly, that's the first time I've heard it parasocial when I read the, read the book um, is probably not a word that we use that we, the lay people use in our everyday life. People who are listening, whether it be, whether they have English as a first language or a second language may not be familiar with that term that kind of describes the audience and performer relationship. Is that right? Yeah. um, It's, typically studied in relation to um, creators and their audiences. So you have this, you can imagine, say, like a celebrity that has a huge fan base and um, all those fans have a more intimate relationship with the celebrity. They might, you know, follow everything they do and, I don't know, put up posters of this person on their wall or whatever, but the celebrity has like no idea who they are. And so um, it's trying to sort of find a way to define that type of relationship where one person has a lot more context than the other and might also just have different expectations. Um, Mm. And I think that's something that a lot of open source developers experience as well with um, contributors and users of their projects. And the language that we usually use to describe open source, um, where even the, the term contributor, which It feels like it's this thing where you're coming in with um, a high amount of context for the person and the project and you're like having a conversation. Um, But in reality, a lot of things that happen in in open source aren't aren't like that, where um, the the maintainer might not necessarily know the other person, might not know what their motivations are, but they're still transacting in some way. Isn't it fair, though, that in the beginning of any system, the idea is that people will, you know, step in, like, let's use like early senators and, and House of Representatives in the United States. The idea was that you're a butcher or a carpenter, you know, or a, a, a tailor, and you decide to go to Washington, do your thing for a couple of terms, and then go back into your into your world. You know, it is a, you step into the spotlight and you step out. But in any cre- creative thing where there's a one-to-many relationship, you can get stuck there. And the next thing you know, 30 years goes by and you're the one person that maintains the open SSL library or whatever. And it's like, well, I guess I'm a five-term senator. Oh, <laughs> it looks like I've been a senator for 60 years. That's not that's not ideal, but it is kind of the nature of one-to-many relationships. Yeah. I mean, it's I haven't heard anyone compare it to um, a politician term yet, but I, I like that. Do we need term limits in open source? I guess <laughs> exactly. that's the question. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is part of why I decided to split the book into um, one aspect of looking at how people make things and another aspect of how people maintain things. Because I think when we talk about publishing code or using code or writing software, um, a lot of it is focused on the making part of it and the creation side. And that's the part that's really fun for a lot of people and is um, intrinsically motivated and um, and just like very exciting. Um, mm-hmm. It's that long, interminable stretch of of maintenance that gets really um, that just challenges some of those assumptions, because as you're saying, it's like, well, I got elected into this position and now I'm just sort of like here and I don't know what to do. Um, Yes. Like I think there are, I mean, there are plenty of examples of maintainers who are able to say, I'm not dealing with this project anymore. I'm going to step away, Um, stepping down, handing over the reins to someone else. And that often happens, but it's not widely socialized as um, I guess like a something that a maintainer can do. And it's sort of, it's mm-hmm. been surprising to me in talking to maintainers across lots of different projects and ecosystems that some of these, um, these are basically like best practices across different 
um, language ecosystems of like how to maintain an open source project, there might be a time when you need to step down or step away. Um, but a lot of maintainers who are just kind of like doing this for the first time on their own and might not actually talk that much to other maintainers and really only have their own narrow experience um, don't know that those kinds of things are available to them. Yeah. And as a, as someone who's both made, maintained, and consumed open source, I have noticed a large number of uh, creators of open source project leads apologizing when they step down. Like they write a big, you know, the, the, the canonical medium post about, you know, I have to spend more time with my family, which is exactly what senators and celebrities do. And they also apologize as well. It seems like we should normalize the, I didn't come here to dance for you all relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's like it's it's such an internal struggle for any creator as well because you're building your reputation and you might enjoy a lot of benefits from like having an audience and you kind of feel this need to continue perpetuating that relationship to continue putting things out there. Um, one of the arguments I make in the book is that reputation for a creator is is itself a form of maintenance um, because. You know, if you, you can imagine someone who has one viral blog post or one viral video or one viral open source project. Um, and like theoretically, they could just never do anything again. They could say, you know, I had this viral blog post and I never wrote another thing. Um, but it's that expectation to continue doing things where you are building a fan base and they want to see like, what are you going to put out next? Um, mm -hmm. That can just create so much pressure on a creator. Uh, it's, it's hard to walk away from, I think. And it's always fascinating when people escape appropriately when you look at people like why the lucky stiff or the people who have done you know deleted their entire blogs and made a 410 gone and said all right i'm done and i'm just i'm out i took my stuff and you'll never see me again we looked up to those people like how did they have the strength yeah. to step to step down i confess i'm i i uh, i'm a little jealous of people that are somehow capable of just deleting everything about themselves online most of us are not really um able to just sort of like walk away from that because it's, the allure is just too great. Um, I think in open source in particular, what makes um, developers different from other types of creators is you have this added level of responsibility um, perceived or real where, you know, like if I am an Instagram creator and I just decide I want to stop pu uh, publishing posts, I can do that. And it's not going to like the world is not going to come crashing down because of that. Um, if I am a developer of a very popular open source project and I decide to just stop maintaining it, um, it could actually like break things for other people or other people are depending on the project um, and not just, you know, hobbyists, but it could be like companies or um, it could be just this like widely used project. Um, and so it becomes a lot harder to say, well, I'm just going to sort of walk away because you feel like, well, I have this like social obligation to other people mm -hmm. to keep this code running. But what is what is the social contract between the performer and the audience? You know? People are all mad because, you know, the person that played Batwoman is not going to be there in season two. And it's like, well, I mean, she got paid, she left. But in open source, someone shows up, makes an amazing thing, and then doesn't get paid. What yeah. is their obligation at all? Exactly. Um, I think it's really hard to make that argument that, well, they should be doing it because, and it's like, well, you know, if they're not getting anything out of it, if it's not fun for them anymore. Maybe it used to be, but it's not. Um, if they're not being paid to do it and it's just a truly a side project, then shouldn't they be able to walk away? And mm -hmm. I think those are some of the big questions that we're, we're facing at open source right now. Well, and you also call out motivation. Like I'm a, I have spent more, less time writing open source code and more time writing on my blog every Tuesday and Thursday for the last 20 years. And this podcast every Thursday for 750 yada yada episodes i have to regularly remind myself like why am i doing this right like is this for the audience and i when i get down i remind myself i i'm doing it for me i enjoy the conversations and the n plus one number of people who listen is is just gravy but i don't know if that works in the open source space yeah i was just thinking about that in relation to my own like blog, newsletter. Um, well, and books. And books, yeah. <laughs> um, books are, well, hopefully easier. I guess, ask me in a couple of years. Um, I, I'm hoping that, you know, you publish it and then I don't have to continually update the book. Um, but with like, I feel definitely feel it for um, blogging. Like I, I recently started a new job um, at the end of last year and suddenly writing in my spare time is a lot harder than it used to be. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it, it is a lot tougher 
to just to think about. There's also this, uh, in, you call it the inherent free rider problem. And this is a thing that comes up consistently where um, I feel entitled to your time, to your support, to your attention, because I am using the free software that you wrote for me. Uh, but then free riders aren't necessarily always individuals. They can be massive companies that feel entitled to your time, even though they've paid you nothing for the code that runs their business. Yeah. Um, one of the things I try to separate out in uh, that part of the book is we talk about the free rider problem in relation to using code. And um, But one of the arguments I hope to make is that it's actually like free to roughly free to the um to the maintainer or the developer, if you want to just take my code and walk away and never interact with me, um, it's actually not the code itself that is depletable as a resource. Um, it is absolutely, you know, replicable, and um, anyone should, should, should feel free to take a copy and and do what they they like with it. The part where it becomes taxing on the maintainer is when they are asking for your attention um, in the form of support requests or issues, um, bug reports, things like that, and so. Um, it, for me, it, like it helps create a little bit of this this mental separation between like what is actually the cost here, and um, it, it, like you know, suggesting that we shouldn't publish code at all, I think, is not actually the solution here that I'm going for. At least, mm -hmm. um, it's really great that we have so much free and publicly available code, and people should continue to do that. It's really more about finding boundaries on the other side of things of. If I'm getting a lot of requests that I don't want to deal with, I should feel comfortable as a maintainer being able to kind of uh, put some boundaries up. Right. You call out the notion of these resources. And then I, I like to say electrons are free. It's molecules that cost. So if you can do something with electrons, that'd be great. But if I have to start physically shipping you molecules, now that's something I can't handle the maintenance and upkeep of. Like you said, if I clone the, the code and I see the fork and I never see you again, that would be ideal. But the molecules in this context would be time itself. For every uh, every five or ten or an hour uh, that I spend debugging a problem for one individual, that's an hour I'm never going to get back as an open source maintainer. Yes, definitely. Um, I have one former colleague at GitHub who used to say that um, he maintains an open source project, and and he would say that you know people think that it's other open source projects or other. Um, software projects that are competing for my time, but it's not. It's my my couch that is competing for your time. Um, it's my personal life, right? Like it's um, especially if you're not directly working on um, open source full time. It's do I answer this random person's support ticket or do I go play with my children in the evening? And uh, it's a very the, the random person is probably not going to win out in that case. So then, where where's the answer though? How do we solve this? Is it on the quote unquote celebrity? The, the person on the other side of the parasocial relationship to set up boundaries? Or do we as, as consumers slash fans need to do a better job of appreciating our, our, you know, our, our creators? Maybe both. Um, I definitely didn't write the book in hopes of um, saying like, this is the answer to everything. But one of, of the course. meta goals with it was being able to just highlight a lot of these dynamics that I felt were not necessarily well explored or understood, even within people who are um, interested in open source. And so I think like part of it is just helping to build that place for conversation, understanding on both sides of it. Of like, I hope people read it who um, use open source projects and understand a little better like what is happening on the other side of things. I hope that um, maintainers read it and it gives them some vocabulary to be able to like have these conversations. Um, and then I, I would also say one of the reasons why I did want to focus on um, GitHub as a platform in the book is that I think platforms have these responsibilities to creators as well to help give them the tools they need to manage their projects. And um, if we look at other platforms, um, we have that same sort of expectation. So uh, with like Twitter, for example, of um, Twitter experimenting with things like hiding replies to your tweet or limiting who can reply to your tweet. Um, or like on Instagram where they have like special creator accounts where um, for people that are experiencing high volumes of DMs um, on Instagram, there's a different way to manage it for creators versus like someone like me who doesn't use it very much at all. Um, and so similarly, I think like one of the reasons why we should sort of like lean into um, 
that relationship between GitHub and its developers is because instead of constantly focusing on exit or saying, well, maybe we should just use some other alternative to GitHub, um, it forces us to be more active citizens and um, of the platform that we are tied to. And so I also hope that um, that GitHub has been and is and will continue to uh, offer tools to developers to help them manage this kind of stuff better. Hey, friends, I want to thank one of our sponsors, the company Text Control. They're the creator of TX Text Control. It's a Microsoft Word-inspired document editor library. It's basically a document processing engine for your web applications. They've got libraries for ASP.NET MVC, for Angular, for Node.js, and they just released a .NET Core version. It lets you basically integrate a WYSIWYG document editor into your web applications. You can edit docs, you can do merge templates, you can include data, you can even create Adobe PDF documents with a fully featured API. It's really pretty amazing. You can try it free, and I encourage you to check out the live demos at textcontrol.com slash demos. Textcontrol.com slash demos. It's really a pretty amazing piece of work. You point out uh, that as a platform, GitHub often falls short of its benefit as a utility because it doesn't always provide the reputational benefits of other platforms. Can you expand on that? Yeah. Uh, some of this is building off of a really great post um, called Status as a Service, which was written by Eugene Wei, um, actually during the time that I was writing the book. Uh, but I, I felt that that post really helped provide some of the vocabulary that we need to talk about the responsibilities that platforms have. And so one of the things that he looks at is um, saying that a platform that becomes widely used often starts out as a utility. It's a, a tool or a service uh, for the creator, but um, the platforms that kind of go beyond that and um, allow creators to quote unquote, like mint their status on the platform, um, end up providing all these other sort of like reputational benefits. And so if you can imagine if, um, like if Twitter didn't have a follower count, um, or a, a clear sense of, you know, who of your mutuals is following whom, um, these are the things that we use to understand, uh, just be able to like place that, that, uh, potential Twitter account um, in our orbit and in our sphere of understanding. Um, Whereas if you go to someone's GitHub profile, it's actually pretty hard to understand even what are the primary projects that they're maintaining? What are they known for? Um, There is a follower account, but it's not really widely used and um, doesn't offer any sort of clear benefits. And so um, one of the arguments I wanted to make is that by not providing this kind of information, um, GitHub is sort of absconding its um, responsibility to developers to help them benefit from their reputation in the same way that any other creator would on any other platform. Um, and I think it's very telling that a lot of developers are building their reputation not on GitHub, but on Twitter um, or TikTok or um, anywhere else um, besides on GitHub itself, which really should be the social platform for developers. That's interesting. That's a big word, though. You're saying absconding kind of their responsibility. You think that GitHub is missing an opportunity here? Is there a product manager somewhere at GitHub that's like, oh, my goodness, I never thought about it that way. We should think about it in a more human terms and and change those relationships. And is this a UX problem that can be solved? Yeah, I definitely think it's resolvable. And I'm not being cynical towards GitHub at all, or in the sense that like, I no, don't, not it's, at all. yeah. <laughs> um, no one's there twirling their mustache. Yeah, I'm not, I'm definitely not sitting here twirling my mustache. <laughs> um, I think I just wanted to like create that framing to even have that conversation and say, like, if we are saying that GitHub has become the de facto platform for open source developers, um, and if we look at the platform creator relationship for other types of creators, um, we can see the ways in which creators benefit from their platform. Now let's compare that back to what's happening on GitHub. Is that same sort of dynamic happening? And it's actually just sort of like completely absent. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I do think a lot of these things are resolvable and I am certain that, uh, I mean, GitHub has already been taking more steps in this direction recently. And so um, like sponsors being a really, one of the really great um, product releases that they had in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I expect that like more of that is going to happen, but it just takes time. And I think it also requires GitHub sort of like seeing itself as that sort of steward um, that has that responsibility. Mm -hmm. One of the, the, the best parts of the book, if I may pick my favorite part is you called out this table and I love me a good table that breaks up high, low, you know, I love, I love a nice axis. And you have an axis on one side, which is contributor growth, 
and an axis on the other time, other side, which is user growth. And then you assign labels to them. And these labels are just genius. Uh, you, you, if you have a federation, it has both high user growth and high contributor growth. And then stadium, I love this word, high user growth and low contributor growth. We're all kind of watching and everyone's using it, but there's not a lot of participatory stuff going on. And then clubs and toys. How did you come up with this characterization? Yeah, it took um, it took some time. And then once I had it, I was like, oh gosh, now I feel like I can talk about the different types of open source projects. I think it, it came out of this sort of hankering for more nuanced vocabulary beyond the term open source project. Um, mm-hmm. One of the one of the things about, I guess, the history of, uh, historically open source is really focused on the distribution side of things. And so open source is just a license and it tells us um, how the code might be used or modified or redistributed. Um, and people who have you know, been in open source for a while or pay, paid close attention for a while know that there are different types of licenses that are discussed to death um, by some developers. Um, but then you kind of look over to the production side of things and it's like, they're just projects um, and people contribute. And it, it feels like we don't really have super nuanced vocabulary to talk about um, what is the difference between a small NPM module and a huge project like Python. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to just like force myself to get that, that kind of vocabulary down. Um, the way I sort of came up with the, those specific categories was um, just thinking about okay, we, we call everyone contributors, but like there isn't really much room to talk about users and their impact on projects um, in our current vocabulary. And so if I sort of like split out this concept of a contributor, um, instead of saying, well, everyone's a contributor, users are contributors too, but there are some people that are purely users and some people that are you know more active contributors. Um, how does that change the shape of the project? Uh, and so, yeah, like I think the one of the more interesting distinctions with Um, just in terms of thinking about different implications, is this separation between um, a club or a federation versus a stadium. A stadium having that sort of parasocial relationship we're talking about where there's just like a few maintainers um, that are uh, doing things for a much wider audience of users. Um, Mm -hmm. Whereas in a club, you can imagine, I mean, literally like a club where uh, there's a larger number of active contributors and not that many people using it. And so it feels a little bit more like a meetup group or everyone who's involved kind of has like high contacts for each other. Um, and then, yeah. And then, and, and then just thinking about, well, how do these different um, project shapes and sizes a- affect how we might think about stewarding and maintaining them? Yeah. I feel like, you know, there's certainly always different taxonomies and ways that one can come up with and how you can pick up a cube and look at it from different angles. But what I really like about this one is it can tell you what your project is now, and then you can decide what you want your project to be. You can say, you know, we're in a a stadium situation here, and this is not what we set out for. We wanted a club, and now too many people are in my little cafe here. I found this great coffee shop. I like to stay here and now everyone else is here. It's not cool anymore. Yes, definitely. Or if you have a huge user base and a few maintainers and you're like, well, maybe we should try to nudge ourselves towards becoming a federation where we actively cultivate a larger contributor base. Um, Yeah, definitely. You should be able to move between categories. So one of the things that I got from the book, and I hope it's the right thing to get, is there there should be in all things an intentionality or a deliberateness. Why are you consuming open source? Why are you doing open source? Why are you a maker? And and kind of questioning it. Like in order to to understand ourselves, we need to kind of stop, pause, classify it to ourselves and say, okay, this is why I'm doing that. Just as I remind myself probably every week or two, why did I come here in the first place? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a, a fair characterization. Um, and part of why I wanted to write something like this was I just felt like there there's a lot of, um, I guess, like assumptions or just things we believe to be true about open source that for some reason have not really made their way out of knowledge circles besides the people who are directly working on open source projects. Um, I don't see those conversations happening as much in um, main, not even mainstream, but in, let's say like in software industry more broadly outside of open source. And so um, I think like having just a place to 
start talking about those kinds of differences and to prompt the sort of reflection of, yeah, what type of project am I or why don't we have more contributors, um, which are the kinds of questions that I hope to address in the book. Where do you want those conversations to to happen, though? It doesn't seem like GitHub is a conversation platform. It seems like there's out of band yeah, location for those things. Yeah, it's, it's not, which is goes back to the whole, um, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> GitHub as a social platform or, or more of a utility. Um, I mean, I think, I guess, like, I mean, hopefully conversations just kind of happen everywhere, but um, a lot of these, at least, I guess maybe I'll answer it with um, where I've sort of gleaned my understanding of how open source works besides obviously talking to people and, um, having worked at GitHub, but, um, but a lot of the research I did for this book and just throughout the, the years that I've been looking at open source, um, just came from like reading blog posts from developers, um, reading their tweets. Um, sometimes people post things as just on GitHub. So there's still some conversation happening there. Um, issue threads for sure. Um, there's a lot of banter that happens. And so, I mean, these kinds of conversations I think are widely distributed, but that's, um, developers actually like for, for having the reputation of not liking writing very much, they, in my view are, um, strangely prolific in terms of just creating a, a lot of um, content and, and sharing their ideas widely. Mm-hmm. One thing I wanted to end on, uh, because I just had Cassidy Williams on the show a couple of weeks ago. Ah, she's is, in the book. She's in the book on page 197. <laughs> so if she's listening, she can flip quickly to the book yes. and find all about her. It's like paragraphs. Um, you point out that she's a software engineer that teaches React development. And you could have stopped there and said that's what she does. But she does TikTok, which we talked about on the show. And uh, she does you know, learning videos and a weekly newsletter and she live codes and da, 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 da. she's a maker. I, I, I see myself in what she does. I'm, people ask me what I do and I, well, I do all these things. I, I'm a professional enthusiast. Uh, you said that she's uh, doing code stuff in public, which you could call open source. But one of the things you call out is that um, her GitHub profile doesn't tell you any of those things. The green graph is the green graph. It's just kind of sitting there. You know, she's popular for something, but what? Um, I think this goes to that opportunity gap that I really hope GitHub does address and and hopefully start to close in on, um, which is that I I think almost like we're just so hung up on the term open source. And like, obviously, the the book is about open source developers. And that's what I say it's about. But it is really maybe about something even broader than that, which I was trying to get to specifically with the example of Cassidy. And she's one of many developers that I've I've seen. seen this with where yeah they might use open source projects they might teach about open source projects um they benefit from open source but like i would characterize a lot of these developers who are growing very large audiences um, cassie has like a huge following on on twitter um they're just like creative people that happen to tinker with software mm-hmm. and there's not we don't really have a term for that i don't think we'll necessarily come up with a great term for that um Mm -hmm. but that stuff goes so much more beyond when we think about an open source developer which is someone who is directly making commits on a on a widely used project or maybe they're involved with the broader open source community um you know organizing events or um or posting education courses uh even in all those definitions of an open source contributor, there still isn't really quite a place in my mind for like, what does it mean to just be a developer with a large audience that produces a lot of software related things? Um, right. And yeah, I think hopefully GitHub uh, is can become a place for, for those people to exist too. Yeah. And there are people who have none of those things and don't do videos and training and they are um, maybe they're a Simpsons character and they don't even use their real name and they may be one of the most influential open source developers in the world and they might not be visible or even have uh, get any benefit from that stuff. They might have trouble finding jobs or tenured academic positions. Yes, uh, that's the other sort of, I think, unfortunate part of it is um, the size of your following and your audience in open source certainly does not correlate to your output. Yeah, I've written about the myth of the 10x developer on my blog, and it's amazing. You get a couple of followers on Twitter, and you have a decent blog, and people ascribe all kinds of things to what they think you're doing with your time versus what you're actually doing with your time. Don't I know it. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, hopefully uh, this was not a bad use of your time because reading the book, Working in Public, was a great use of my time. And I really appreciate chatting with you today. Thank you for having me. You can check out the book, Working in Public. I'll include a link in the show notes and you can follow Nadia on Twitter. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.